trời tại thôi tạm bà mình đôi nít tế dương đừng trời sạp tại tôi chỉ rằng là có đau có xa xây mình ban đo hai phòng chạy lẹ thả hai đợt vây ban chỉ quật chưa chạy lư rừng đi nụ tế xa phía nhà có mình ai bắt đầu chú nợ tí, nợ tí ho nà mùi đại bà chí chôn trở bàn xâm lạp đòi xa tài quật chìa bột xa xe nực nụ tế bùng miên phó tăng nà mùi rô bó xa hạ phía nhà trở bàn bóng hàn ảo lưu bì vị mẹ tệ sáng sáy đại thả bột xa xe nực trở bàn xâm lạp nụ tế xâm khăn chiên đi tới tiết nụ phó tăng bùng miên bỏ ra miên nà đại bà chụp tùm nẹ tùm nôn xa xa nà rồi bỏ chôn rong khúa tờ nâng ca cháu lưu ca xâm lập nụ tì nụ bê nì khi nhóm nâng chạp đá bằng hai nhóm bì ca cháu bạc căn lưu ca bằng phá nhu vọt ả rám rư cổ bà 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 mần mên xâm lập cù bằng nông xa xa nà tẹo tô nâng ca bằng phá nhu vọt ả rám rư cổ bà 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 chỉ đồng bông khi nhóm xung lược làng thả Phó tăng tên ổ trời bằng hành thả Vật ả ràm chỉ trang trời bán bóng phán Rư có tích tuôn nơi khăn ông ổng lòng bê sẵn kìm xì vừ Rư có đòi xa ca tùm lẹ khóa bạch đòi xa hạ rọt ảm mệt Tí bì Phó tăng đại rực tập bắt Khó khăn khăn ông ca bằng hành thả Miên tùm rung chìa bỏ bọn chỉ trong bàn chóp cứ miên phò ta mui bàn chẹt thả nơi ti cong phnom penh vọt nơi tại đầm nai cá hai thả miên bứt tạc ca chia phơi ca đại miên ca châu ruộng pi mận tây rồi bọc cam bơ chia bơ chia thập tây nơi ai ti vọt ả rám rư cổ miên ca châu ruộng pi bạch song phong đài tệ tôn nâng ca pra pra vọt ả rám đại mận men sầm rập cù bầm nong sát sanh cứ trầm trâu sọp tam cả lạc thế sạc đại cam bởi chìa bởi chìa thập tài bàn chụp bởi tế nông bê nụ Đối đại dương bàn bởi phía xa ca bởi xa bởi đà môn thả cam bởi chìa bởi chìa thập tài cứ chìa bởi tế đại tư bởi tài chanh bì sẵn kìm xì vừa nâng ca tùm lẹ cổ bài rõ bò xa hạ rõ ảm rích rõ chân nàm mộc hào Ní miên này thả À kia xa thiên nặng chứa chá ra trời bàn bóng phá Tì tăng xa thiên nặng cư miên cầm rất Xâm rạp tục sớm thuần như chết Rư cổ bà 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 chìa xa thà ní nó cổ bà Nó cổ ông lẽ khá ní Cá bà 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 Cư bà ai tử lưu cá kết cú chìa tù tơ mùi Cư mần mên chìa chạy tà ná khá nông ca thuần tục bọc mần ánh lưu bột xa xa ná nụ tì Nói bây này, khi nhóm nâng bằng hai anh ông bây chấm nói trong cái đó cứ ca cổ rụp xa xa nà. Bà dương bình đất chế ruông, phó tăng bằng hai anh thả, bà chí chôn ác rư co mần ác cổ rụp xa xa nà, cứ ả xa rai tới nâng tì cần lai rạp bỏ quạt. Đôi bích chùm, đại chế lê khá xa rộng trăm cọ bàn phát đo xa khai cảm thả. Bà chí chôn ai bà bà tế bát xa xa nà bà bút đào xe rây nơi khăn ông xa rộng trăm cọ. Bà bà đà chí con ai mù hương bàn bà đào xa khai cảm thà. Bà ông bà rịp chăm bì thi bút xa xa nà mùi chùm nuôn nơi khăn ông rô bóp Campuchia bà chí thập bà tài. Ông hai đà thà bà cù đà bà bà đào phó tăng thà bà kê mình ai bà tế bạch xa xa nà rồi bọc luôn đòi xe rấy cứ mân bằng hai anh thả bàn cạch là đòi xa tài miên côn dụ bài chìa phá lời ca nụ tì hào chìa bị xe mân mên miên côn bằng nông thuy túc bọc mân ninh bút xa xa nức nụ có tì đài là tập hò là tập hiếp đài rất tập bắt khăn nông ca bà tế bạch bị thi xa xa nà chạy liệt có đòi xa tài cảm bồi chia bồi chia thập tài cầm bông miên sừng kềm chỉ mui nông việt nam nâng mà giang vĩnh 
ทนเทียนระบอกล้วนก็เมียนกำนัดลึกปีนี้แต่เตียนนุการรัฐบัตเมียนแต่เลือปวดกามปจีปจีทับไทยดาวมันเกิดปีศาสนาระบอกกวาดนุเตในกรุบกะละเตสะแตงอ๋อการรัฐบัตรัฐเพียบระบอบประจิจุนขนมกาปฏิบัติศาสนาคือมันจัดตุกถ่าจีอุกรตกรรมในการถุยตุกบอกมันเองหรือศาสนาหนุ่ตีการรัฐบัตรเจริญเตลือสิทธิ์ระบอบประจิจุนขนมปฏิกาปฏิบัติศาสนาเตลือบานอันยาดในกรามฉบับอันตรจิตอาศัยเหตุนี้คือมันมีนกาหุ่มลูกหรือสิทธิ์เจียมูลฐานได้ดำเนินโดยฉบับอันตรจิตสำหรับกาสนทานหรืออุกตกรรมถือตุกบกมันเองหรือศาสนาหนุ่ยโดยนี่หายกาดัตุลูกนวลเจียหรืออุกตกรรมนี้คือมันอาจจะรวยเตะขยมส้มบรรจับกาบัดบังหายบอกขยมในปีนี้ลูกประเทียนในปีนี้ขยมส้มจูนเวทกาตสะพิตาบอกขยมอันตรจิตบอกขยมคือลูกใส่โดเรนเจนได้นั่งไปเพียซาอัมปีกาประพฤติหรืออัตตะเตหิ้นนั่งมนตรีสาธีนารอดสมอคุณทุกทีสมเชยอยู่ตรี Thank you and good morning, Mr. President, Your Honours, parties, and members of the public. The fourth and final alleged targeted group in our tribe is former Khmer Republic, that is, former Lon Nol soldiers and And in this session, I'll be addressing the co-prosecutor's argument that this group were victims of political persecution that were ultimately systematically executed. Mr. President, you'll recall that this question was extensively discussed in case 00 You'll also recall that the Supreme Court chamber, in fact, acquitted Nun Chia of all charges in this room. That chamber concluded that there was no evidence of a policy contemplating the execution of former Khmer Republic soldiers and officials between April and May. Well, the exact same reasoning applies here. The co-prosecutor's position is mostly based on anonymous and uncorroborated hearsay. On out-of-court evidence and on unauthenticated documents. They strangely also still rely heavily on the very same evidence they presented in case 002-01, despite the fact that the Supreme Court Chamber found it to be insufficient. On a separate issue, it's also worth us noting from the outset that our team was forced to operate in the dark regarding charges on former Khmer Republic soldiers and officials. As detailed in our brief, the scope of the charges was never clearly defined, so it's impossible, in fact, for us to know the case we have to answer. Nevertheless, here and in our brief, we do address the evidence that the co-prosecutors presented. And what you'll see, as I'll discuss in the first part of my presentation, is that they rely on such weak evidence for a very simple reason. There was never a CPK policy to target former Khmer Republic soldiers and officials. In the second part of my presentation, you'll see that even when looking at the factual allegations on the ground, nothing proves that in practice, former soldiers Soldiers or officials of the Khmer Republic were systematically persecuted or executed due to their political opinions. Now, turning to the first issue of policy, what the co-prosecutors claim is that the CPK had a policy to target officers and senior civil servants from the Khmer Republic and to execute them. Similarly. 
so-called ordinary Khmer Republic soldiers were allegedly, and I quote, viewed with suspicion that often led to execution. Unsurprisingly, however, the co-prosecutors failed to back this up with any reliable evidence. First, the co-prosecutors argue that in April and May 1975, CPK leaders, including Nguyen Chia, disseminated orders to remove or eliminate high-ranking Khmer Republic soldiers and officials, unquote. Now this claim mostly relies on the testimony of one M. Un, who was a civil party who testified in case 002-01, not in this trial, and who had been a doctor working in the East Zone. Once again, however, Mr. President, the co-prosecutors misrepresent the evidence. What M. Un in fact said was that Nguyen Chia talked about, and I quote, finding individuals who burrow within the party, unquote. M. Un did not hear Nguyen Chia talking about former members of the Khmer Republic regime. Rather, his impression his evidence is that it was I'm sorry his impression that Nguyen Chia talked about them Mr. President, Your Honours I don't need to tell you this obviously someone's impressions are not proof beyond reasonable doubt and when you review the sources quoted in the court prosecutor's brief in addition to M. Un they also rely on S21 chief Doik and the alleged photographer Nem N to argue the existence of a nationwide policy. However, as we've argued extensively in our brief and we'll discuss this afternoon, those are some of the least credible witnesses in this entire trial. And then the other sources that the co-prosecutors use are written records of interviews of people who did not testify, their DC CAM statements, their books of academics, newspaper articles, and even S21 statements. The co-prosecutors even go so far as to rely on second-hand hearsay allegedly attributed to the late Yen Sari. The co-prosecutors also heavily rely on unauthenticated lists of people who have allegedly been arrested. And these lists are the so-called Tramcock district records as well as S21 lists. What the prosecutors argue is that the mere fact that former Khmer Republic soldiers and officials are listed shows a targeting policy. However, as we discussed last week, the Tramcock district records have no probative value whatsoever. Neither do S21 lists, as my colleague Victor Coppe will discuss later today. And even if we were to consider these kinds of documents as reliable, the mere fact that someone's former job is listed does not mean that he or she was arrested on that basis. So to take an example, if I were arrested by the police, my current profession would be listed on the official paperwork. This would not mean, however, that I was necessarily arrested because I'm a lawyer at the ECC. And again, Your Honours, quantity of evidence is not proof beyond reasonable doubt, as the Supreme Court chamber has unequivocally held. Moreover, the reality is that the co-prosecutors are unable to present any official CPK document calling for the persecution or execution of former Khmer Republic soldiers and officials. And why? Because there was never any such policy. And then in an attempt to cover up the lack of credible and objectively reliable evidence, the co-prosecutors argue that any reference to so-called enemies in the official CPK documents includes members of the former regime. However, this, as explained last week by my colleague Liv Savana, is pure speculation, not backed by evidence. And to yes, Mr. President, I'll slow down. 
to remind you of what my colleague Liv Savannah said. Enemies were people who conducted activities against national security. Their former jobs did not matter. Their political views did not matter. Their religion did not matter. What mattered were their actions. No more and no less. Second, the co-prosecutors failed to provide any link, any evidence linking Nguyen with the alleged persecution or killing of former Khmer Republic soldiers and officials. All the evidence that they do refer to in this regard is either misrepresentative or inconclusive. And I'll give you an example. Please take a look at graph 318 of the co-prosecutors' brief. The co-prosecutors argue that Nguyen Chia instructed cadres to identify and smash the enemy. They further argue that when referring to the so-called enemy, Nguyen Chia was specifically referring to those who had served the Khmer Republic regime. However, none of the evidence cited in support of this allegation actually shows that Nguyen Chia identified former Khmer Republic soldiers or officials as enemies. The co-prosecutors further refer to Nguyen Chia's knowledge that seven so-called Lon Nol super traders were called for and then executed. They also allege that he, quote, admitted, unquote, to Tet Sambat, that the top leadership of the Khmer Republic regime was, quote, liquidated, unquote. However, once again, Mr. President and Your Honours, evidence must be seen in context. What Nguyen Chia actually said to Tet Sambat when asked about any orders regarding former Khmer Republic soldiers and top officials after the 17th of April 1975 was that, and I quote him here, as I recall, Defeated soldiers were to surrender their weapons and return home. Nunchi also explicitly said to Tet Samba that he was not aware of the killings of former soldiers. He even added that, quote, if I had known then, we would have taken preventive measures to stop that kind of killing because they'd done nothing wrong. They were normal soldiers, unquote. Your Honours, the principle is clear. If the co-prosecutors are relying on what is said in this video, then they must also accept the exculpatory aspect they can't just cherry-pick. Ultimately, moreover, this is the extent of the co-prosecutors' attempts to link Nunchi with an official policy to persecute and execute former Khmer Republic soldiers and officials. There is nothing here permitting a finding of guilt beyond reasonable doubt. Further on the question of policy, four former DK cadres from three different zones categorically denied, they categorically denied the existence of a persecution and execution policy. The first two of these were from the southwest zone. We had Pek Chim, the former Trumpak district chief. We also had, secondly, Sao Van, who'd been a commune committee member in various locations during the decade. The co-prosecutors focus on Salvan. They argue that Salvan's evidence is not credible due to, and I quote, fundamental inconsistencies and his inclinations to minimize his knowledge of crimes. Mr. President, I think you'll note that this is not the same standard that the co-prosecutors apply for individuals who appear on their behalf. Many of their witnesses would not have any credibility under this standard, especially their star witness, Doik. In any event, the co-prosecutors fail to substantiate their position. As we've explained extensively in our brief, Salvan is a credible 
Credible witness. And this was moreover confirmed by the Supreme Court Chamber. That chamber, as you'll recall, relied on South Island's evidence, among others, to acquit Nguyen Chia of the charges related to the treatment of former Khmer Republic soldiers. Now, the third former cadre who testified to the treatment of former Khmer Republic soldiers and officials is Prakut, the former secretary of Kampong Siem District in Sector 41 of the Central Zone. And her evidence fully summarizes the CPK's approach. What she said was that at a 1977 meeting, the Secretary Ta An reportedly said the following, and I'll quote, He instructed to identify former Long Nol soldiers who were considered not good. And for those who were good, they were spared. Prakut added, those who were good could live peacefully. Fourthly and finally, the former Northwest Zone cadre, Li Nook, confirmed that no specific policy applied to former Khmer Republic soldiers and officials. He explained that soldiers and officials from the previous regime quote, could live peacefully unquote, in his area. And this evidence from these high level cadres is corroborated by many others, as detailed at length in our brief. As a last note on policy, the evidence shows that some members of the former regime, in fact, held leadership positions during the decay. For example, in cooperatives like Kampong Leng or Ponyang Lu, and in the military. Your Honours, I think it's quite clear. This is hardly consistent with the existence of a policy aiming to target persecute and execute them all. What the evidence instead illustrates is the legitimate, official, CPK, national defense and security policy. As long as individuals were not found guilty of activities threatening state security, they were trusted and assimilated, regardless of their background. Now, not only is there no credible evidence that former Khmer Republic soldiers and officials were systematically identified in an effort to later target them, there's also no evidence that they were systematically killed, and even less so as a result of their political beliefs. When we look at the factual allegations on the alleged implementation of a policy in practice, the theme is the same. The co-prosecutors fail to present credible and reliable evidence. Mr. President, Your Honours, I ask you, please review the documents cited in the co-prosecutors' brief. You will see that they are mostly untested written records of interviews, out-of-court statements, or documents taken out of context. You will also see that in fact, there is no evidence that people were systematically targeted or later killed because they were associated with the former Republic. When one looks closely, what one sees is that the evidence cited by the co-prosecutors only shows that people who happened to have been associated with the former regime were targeted. What it does not establish is the reason for their arrest or execution. Indeed, in most cases, no details are provided as to the reasons for the arrest of the individuals. And where such detail is available, what we in fact See is that only some former Khmer Republic soldiers or officials were concerned. Those who were engaged in activities threatening the regime. I'll give you an example here. A September 1976 this telegram, in fact, refers to soldiers engaged in, I quote, no good movements, unquote. Prakut 
also confirmed the distinction between regular people and people engaged in any activity. Similarly, even if you could rely on the unreliable Trump Cup district records, one of them, which is a 9 April 1977 report, that's numbered E3-4103, that report asks for guidance about what to do with, and I quote, those who hold a ranking position and soldiers, Now, had there been a policy to destroy them, would there even be a need to ask for such guidance? Mr. President, the reality is that any measure taken which may have affected individuals associated with the Khmer Republic were legitimate measures resulting from the CPK's national defense and security policy, as we discussed last week. Like in many countries worldwide today, people were arrested because of their own criminal actions, not because of their former positions or political views. And furthermore, while there might have been some isolated examples of people targeted on the basis of their association with the Khmer Republic, these actions were the result of local authorities acting autonomously. They were deviations from the official policy, as we detailed in our brief. And there is no link between these crimes and the CPK. Finally, and very much like in case 002-01, the co-prosecutors failed to establish beyond reasonable doubt that former Khmer Republic soldiers and officials were systematically killed due to their political views or membership of the former regime. The co-prosecutors use only anecdotal and unsubstantiated evidence in this regard. But this this fails to demonstrate beyond reasonable doubt again, that the killings were due to their specific background. And to give you just one example, at paragraph 326 of their brief, the co-prosecutors state that, and I quote, Commune Chief Tachang called on all residents to a meeting and publicly bludgeoned a man and his son to death on allegations of non-known connections and possessing a weapon, unquote. Your Honours, this statement is simply factually incorrect. In fact, you just need to look at the quotes in the co-prosecutor's own footnote. Prom Sarun said that the person was, and I quote, perhaps, perhaps, what was sure, however, is that this person had hidden a gun. And I quote, for that reason, for that reason, he was snatched, unquote. Mr. President, how does this constitute evidence of killing a person associated with the former regime? It just doesn't. Ultimately, and very much like the allegations on the treatment of the Cham, the Vietnamese and the Buddhists, there is simply no credible evidence to support the prosecutor's case on former Khmer Republic soldiers and officials. Now, Your Honours, this concludes our presentation regarding the treatment of targeted groups. And in the time I have remaining, I'll now begin to present the CPK's policy on cooperatives and work Cooperatives and work sites are foundational to communist ideology. Their textbook examples of how a collectivized communist economy is created. As such, they were established throughout the decade as part of the CPK's socialist revolution. And because of how widespread they were, they're central to many Cambodian CK experience. They've become central to the Manichaean narrative. And because of that, 
Of course, they become central to the co-prosecutor's case. Now these days, collectivization can seem unusual. It differs dramatically from what is practiced in so-called Western liberal democracies. However, we cannot look at things in this kind of historical vacuum. Back in 1975, we were at the height of the Cold War, and economic and social collectivization was a widespread global phenomenon. And more importantly, Western liberal democracies do not define the universal standard of right and wrong. As tempting as it may be, to some, to use this as an occasion to put communism on trial, this is totally inappropriate and well outside this tribunal's mandate. To put it simply, the differences between ideologies and their approaches to governance are legally irrelevant here.